All right. Good evening, everyone. I'm just going to quickly get my computer set up here. Fantastic. All right. Uh, maybe Yelda, could you just let me know if you can see my slides? Yes, we can see it. Fantastic. All right. Welcome, everyone, to, to this evening's uh, Gecko session. Um, as you all are familiar by now, Gecko is hosted by the Gastro Foundation in association with Project Echo uh, from, the, uh, from the University of New Mexico. Um, it's run every Monday at half past four, and you, you are all obviously very welcome to it. Just some housekeeping rules, if you can maybe, as we go through, you're more than welcome to interrupt me if you'd like to. Um, the chat will be open for, for any questions that we can answer at the end. Um, and uh, lastly, just thank you to, to both the ECHO Project ECHO and the Gecko Foundation for inviting me to speak this evening. We currently have, uh, I think, participants registered from, from six countries, uh, probably not all online yet, but we've had those from Zimbabwe, uh, Mozambique, Nigeria, Sudan, Uganda, and of course, South Africa. So you're all very welcome to this evening's session. So I've been asked to speak on the classification pathology and diagnosis of pancreatic cancer. Um, so as you can imagine, this is an incredibly large, diverse topic. Uh, and I must say up front that I'm not a pathologist. So this is really going to be from a surgeon's point of view. Um, and, and because of the, the, the sort of how large the topic is and what it's going to cover, I'm really going to touch on a sort of more of an approach to the classification and pathology as opposed to, to going into in depth regarding that. So as mentioned, please just uh, interrupt me if you want to as we go along or put questions in the chat group. All right, so we're going to start off with classification. As mentioned, the classification when it comes to pancreatic cancer is very broad. Um, there, there are numerous approaches and numerous classifications. Probably the most well-known one is the WHO classification. And we're currently on the fifth edition, the last published in 2019. And here it's based almost exclusively on histological appearance. So you can imagine from a clinical perspective, it's sometimes quite difficult to utilize these classifications in a clinical setting. Um, so really, to, to, to my way of thinking, there, there are three practical ways of classifying pancreatic neoplasms. And the first is to use a classification that's based on the cellular components of the gland. And, and we know that the pancreas is made up of uh, islet cells, acinous cells, there's ductile and mesenchymal elements. So within each of these, there's a, uh, one can sort of subdivide it into a benign and a malignant component arising from one of those cell types. More commonly, they're based on histological differentiation or biological behavior. And the WHO, as I mentioned, is on a histological appearance. And they classify these as epithelial or non-epithelial. But there are classifications that quite nicely subclassify these into benign, pre-malignant, and malignant lesions. Clinically, though, I think all of you are going to need to, over the next couple of years, and uh, develop your own approach, and largely because of of this. This is the WHO classification, and, and I think we can all appreciate I mean, there are more than 50 tumors just in the, the epithelial benign and malignant classifications, according to the WHO. So with more than sort of 90, 95% of them being in a handful of lesions, and the rest being extremely rare, from a clinical perspective, it's not practical to, to go through a classification like this. So you really do need to develop your own. And, and uh, I'm going to try to show you how I do it. Um, it's a combination of, of, of the two approaches, but really to try to break it down for you. So I start off by breaking these into primary and secondary lesions. Um, the secondary lesions, uh, we rely heavily on cross-sectional imaging, as we're going to go through later. I subdivide them into hypervascular lesions or hypervascular lesions, depending on the, the contrast dynamics. And, and I think we're all familiar with the, the, the hypervascular uh, metastases to the pancreas that can occur. And this is just a list. 
of them. And really the hypervascular ones are those rare primaries that metastasize to, to the pancreas that are not on, on the list here, but can be from any, any uh, primary site. What we're gonna do is focus more on the primary here. So here, what I do is break it up into cystic and solid lesions. And within each of these, subdivided into three different components, benign, pre-malignant and malignant. With regards to the cysts, uh, I'm not going to, it's not the sort of topic of the talk tonight, um, but really the benign ones, the vast majority are made up by inflammatory or pseudocysts, more than 75%. But the one that we need to know about is, is on top of that, that's fairly common, is the serocystic neoplasm. We have these pre-malignant lesions. Uh, so the introductal neoplasms that we'll talk about a little bit later. The common one that we're all familiar with is IPMN or in introductal papillary mucinous neoplasm, but there are others like the introductal tubular papillary or the introductal oncocytic papillary neoplasms that are of more rare. And then obviously the more common mucinous cystic neoplasms, these all being pre-malignant lesions. And then in the malignant group really are, are the malignant counterpart or the malignant de-differentiation of these lesions. So uh, the IPMN and mucinous cystic neoplasms with associated uh, invasive carcinoma component. And then we need to think about cystic neuroendocrine tumors here, uh, the solid pseudopapillary neoplasms, and then uh, for all sort of intended purposes, the serocystic neoplasm is benign, but there are case reports of serocystic adenocarcinomas, so I, I sort of clump it into this, this malignant group here. More commonly, we deal with the solid lesions, and, and this is where the diagnostic dilemma can come in. So here again, the AR, uh, benign ones, one needs to think about autoimmune pancreatitis. So more commonly, the mass is with type 2, uh, but can be in type 1. Chronic pancreatitis with a fiber inflammatory mass and groove pancreatitis are often the ones that, that, that we, we struggle to, to differentiate from a malignant lesion. The pre-malignant lesions in the solid group really come down to uh, pancreatic intraepithelial neoplasm, so the precursor uh, to, to ductal adenocarcinoma. And then in the malignant group, what I do here is break it down into the underlying cellular components. So the malignant tumors that arise from the ductal elements, the ACNI cells, which is the vast majority of the pancreas, uh, although a fairly rare tumor, neuroendocrine tumors, and then the mesenchymal tumors like GISTs or fibrous or comas, and then lastly, lymphomas. The neuroendocrine tumor component we can further classify based on either differentiation or functionality. So when we think about the differentiation, we all know based on the KI67 or the mitotic index, we can further classify them into well differentiated, so grade one to grade three, or poorly differentiated, grade three or neuroendocrine uh, tumors, neuroendocrine carcinomas. The functionality, again, I think we're all familiar with breaking them, sort of further subclassifying them as non-functional neuroendocrine tumors and functional neuroendocrine tumors. With the functional ones, really depending on the underlying amine or peptide that they, they secrete. And, uh, you know, the two common ones that, that we see are the insulinomas and gastronomas. So that's really my, my approach to a classification uh, using both the histological as well as the sort of the benign, pre-malignant and malignant. I'm going to briefly move on, and I'm sorry that this is a very didactive lecture, it's just that uh, the topic is, is a bit difficult to, to ask uh, questions around. Um, but from a diagnosis perspective, again, because it's such a broad topic, I've tried to give you more of an approach than, than uh, going to the specifics, which we can do a little bit later. So practically what I do here is break it up into metastatic and local regional disease. Metastatic disease, very easy because one's going to target the underlying primary and uh, focus on, on the diagnosis of the underlying primary. But if one can't, then really it comes down to histological confirmation through a biopsy of the metastatic lesion. The local regional disease is where we need to, to think a bit more. And generally, we sort of take a history from our patients first. So what I do is break them down from a local regional perspective into either functional or non-functional tumor, because it's gonna change the way that, that I approach my patient. So if there is evidence of functionality, then really we use a combination of biomarkers, histology, and, and very importantly, multimodal imaging 
to, to make the diagnosis in terms of a functional tumor. Non-functional tumors, again, just from a simplistic perspective, break them down based on your preliminary uh, imaging into cystic or solid tumors. And as you'll see with, with uh, all pancreatic tumors, we really heavily rely on cross-sectional imaging, good cross-sectional imaging. And so here, the solid lesions, uh, based on the contrast dynamics, break them down into hyperattenuating lesions, those that are isoattenuating, and then the hyperattenuating lesions. And similar to what I mentioned previously, these are the hyperattenuating lesions that we see, but be, one's always got to think with regards to primaries, neuroendocrine tumors, your solid pseudopapillary neoplasms, and your acinous cell tumors or carcinomas that are, that are uh, generally hyperattenuating on imaging. There are going to be cases, especially in the sort of the first two groups, where small lesions are missed on your initial Im cross-sectional imaging. And it doesn't really make a difference uh, whether you're using contrast-enhanced MRI scans or CT scans. There's going to be these small tumors that one's going to miss. And the other difficulty is those that are isoattenuating. So the same density or intensity as the pancreatic parenchyma, they're often quite difficult to see on the initial imaging. And so it's this group that we, we rely on multimodal imaging. So we're going to touch on it a little bit later, but, but this is a sort of the area where if you've used a, a CT scan, you might want to use an MRI. And more recently, the, the real value around endoscopic ultrasound. With regards to cystic lesions, it goes without say that, that we need to use multimodal imaging in order to make the diagnosis. And again, recently, you know, the huge benefit of cyst fluid analysis in making the diagnosis has prompted endoscopic ultrasound as one of the real vital investigations in cystic lesions in the pancreas. So that's my sort of broad approach on a classification and, and an approach to diagnosis of pancreatic neoplasms. We're now going to touch on the pathology. And, and as I mentioned, you know, being clinicians, this is not our strongest point. And, and so this is going to come from a surgeon's perspective and not a pathologist's perspective. We're going to touch basically on uh, using the similar approach that I've just mentioned, functional tumors, then the non-functional uh, solid tumors, and then cystic lesions. So let's start with the functional solid lesions. And the one that comes to mind here that we need to know about is the neuroendocrine neoplasms. Um, they can arise pretty much anywhere in the, the GIT system from uh, the, uh, any area where we have neuroendocrine cells within the body. From the pancreas, initially or traditionally, historically, we used to talk about islet cell tumors because from a morphological and a histological perspective and, and from a functional perspective, they resemble, resembled islet cells. But nowadays we, we, we've come to appreciate that it's really just the morphology and, and more likely in the pancreas, these are arising from pluripotential stem cells, more commonly from either the ductal or the acinous system. They range in size, and this, this changes their appearance specifically on, 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 on imaging. The small lesions are often very well-defined and homogeneous. And as they become larger, they become fairly heterogeneous with uh, quite a lot of cystic degeneration and necrosis and can over time develop calcification. So making the, the, the radiological appearance of these lesions quite uh, diverse. Histologically, they, it's fairly easy to pick up these lesions. I'm just going to get my pointer going here. So this is just an h and &E stain. And what you see really is, is these very uniform polygonal cells that are arranged in what they call nests. Typically, the, the nuclei are oval or, or round, and they have this very characteristic salt and pepper appearance that, that is termed a stippled appearance. And, and lastly, this very sort of eosinophilic granular cytoplasm that you see. With regards to diagnosing them, we really do need histological confirmation in order to do immunohistochemistry. And synaptophysin and chromogranin 
A are the two stains that we use. And it's, and it's exceedingly rare that you can have a neuroendocrine tumor that doesn't stain positive for one of these two stains. So on the left here, this one here, you can see the synaptophysin stain positive. And on the right, you can see chromogranin A. So when we, need, when we make the diagnosis of, of a functional PNET, obviously we're starting off with the history but, and the clinical examination, but, but we really do rely on biochemical analysis, uh, imaging, and as now mentioned, histology. From the history perspective, uh, one really wants to try elicit whether or not your patient's got functional symptoms, and we'll, we'll touch on that now. We also got to think about family history and genetic syndrome. So don't remember, don't forget that there's a high or there's an association with certain genetic syndromes like tubular sclerosis, neurofibromatosis type one, men one syndrome, von hippel lindau syndrome. So all of those sort of, if you are, do have evidence of a functional tumor to try sort of elicit whether or not those are, are, are positive or present or not. And then the, the, the characteristic rash of a rash in a glucagonoma, we often forget about rashes, but, but um, more often than not, you get sent a patient with a rash that's been confirmed to be necrolytic migratory uh, erythema. And, and they ask you then to try determine whether or not this patient has a glucagonoma or not. So when it comes to functional symptoms uh, or functional PNETs and non-functional PNETs. It's a bit, a bit of a misnomer because all pancreatic nets, neuroendocrine tumors, do secrete substances. Uh, the the, the non-functional tumors do secrete chromogranins, neuron-specific enolase, pancreatic polypeptides, ghrelin, things like that. The difference is that they don't present with a clinical hormonal syndrome and therefore are termed non-functional. So their clinical symptoms on history are generally the sort of vague abdominal pain uh, or they've been picked up incidentally. And the biochemical marker that we use more, most commonly is the chromogranin A. There are others, but, but the most sensitive is, is the chromogranin A. So clinically, that's what, what, that, that's what we use. And then the rest depend on what type of peptide or amine that they're secreting and the functionality thereof. So the two common ones are obviously the insulomas and, and gastronomas. Insulinoma patients, uh, vast, you know, most of them are, are fairly indolent, but the, those that are secreting uh, insulin, they, they present with a very classical uh, repetitive presentation to their clinics <coughs> where they have symptoms of adrenergic or neuroglycopenic type symptoms. So they, they complain of sudden onset flushing, sweating. Uh, they have polyphagia. They become uh, lightheaded, uh, confused. And while we're waiting for our biochemical testing, we can confirm these to a certain extent with uh, that sort of Whipple's tribe that everyone's familiar with. But if on a biochemical level, what we need to test is the serum insulin and the C-peptide in order to determine whether or not this patient during the hypoglycemic event has endogenous hypersecretion of insulin. Your gastronomas are the other common one that, that, that uh, you're going to see. And really here they have the, the history of recurrent peptic ulcer disease, either being uh, gastric or duodenal ulcers. And very characteristically, this acid-induced diarrhea. And again, while you're waiting for your patient, uh, weaning them off their, their proton pump inhibitors in order to do a fasting gastrin level, one can treat the diarrhea by just placing a nasogastric tube on free drainage. And because it's acid-induced, <clears throat> by placing it on free drainage, the, the diarrhea stops and, and that's often a very good clue. And then the rarer ones, um, the glucagonomas, the somatostatinomas, again, uh, with these uh, sort of functional syndromes that, that I'm sure all of us here are familiar with. So we rely on imaging, as mentioned previously, and, and whether you choose uh, an MRI scan or a CT scan up front, uh, they're both very sensitive and very specific. Uh, the, the importance is really the contrast dynamics of it. And uh, the take-home message, I think, for neuroendocrine tumors <clears throat> is that you have to ask your, your radiologist to perform the timing of the contrast in an early arterial phase. So traditionally, 
the, the, uh, for pancreatic imaging, we just need a dual phase. And that's really your late arterial phase, which is around 35 to 40 seconds. And then your delayed or portovenous phase, which is around 70 seconds. And that's because in all the other sort of pancreatic lesions, the late arterial phase is best for visualizing pancreatic primary lesions. Pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors are different. So here you want an early arterial phase, so around 25 to 35 seconds. So whenever you're thinking of a pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor in your patient, it's best to ask for a triple phase uh, CT scan and really let your radiologist know what timing you, you, you're specifically looking for. <clears throat> Both MRI and CT scans with regards to small insulinomas or gastrinomas are a bit of a problem. So they the, the sensitivity does drop off in this instance. And the only real benefit to an MRI over a CT scan is when it comes to liver metastases, where the sensitivity is slightly higher than, than CT scan. But otherwise, the choice is, is, is really sort of uh, institution dependent. Endoscopic ultrasound uh, is a fantastic imaging modality, especially for small neuroendocrine tumors and those that are somatostatin receptor naive. So for example, insulinomas, they don't have uh, somatostatin type two receptors, they don't express them. And so the avidity for your dotatate and your, your dotatoc PET CTs, the somatostatin uh, radio labeled analog doesn't, uh, isn't sort of bound to, 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 to the receptors. So one can miss it there. The actual somatostatin and analog imaging um, and FDG PET CTs are really not used as much for the, for the diagnosis, but rather the localization and your staging of, the pank of, of, of these lesions. So I'm not going to go into too much uh, detail there. And then as mentioned, <clears throat> for the NETS, uh, pancreatic uh, neuroendocrine tumors, one does need histological uh, confirmation. And really here, yeah, it's not only to, to make the diagnosis, but it also helps us classify. So uh, specifically with, with mutations, for example, differentiating your G3 lesions, your neuroendocrine tumors from your neuroendocrine carcinomas, with the former being having mutation in your DATS and your ATRX, genes and, and the latter, your neuroendocrine carcinomas having mutations more commonly in your P53 and your RB gene. So this is the typical imaging uh, or typical appearance of a, of a small neuroendocrine tumor. And what you can see here is a very well circumscribed hypervascular or hyper dense or hyper attenuating lesion in the neck of the pancreas. And as I mentioned before, the real take home message hopefully is that you really want to ask your radiologist to, to use an early arterial phase here. So around 25 to 35 seconds in order to be able to demonstrate this lesion uh, clearest on your, on your pancreatic cross-sectional imaging. The larger lesions are often fairly heterogeneous. So, so this one is hyper dense. Uh, and fairly homogeneous, but they can become <coughs> heterogeneous with necrotic cystic changes within them. Even the bigger lesions do seem to have this hyper dense or hyper attenuating rim that you can see quite nicely over here, it's still preserved. And very characteristically, these lesions displace rather than invade lesions. So very rarely are you going to see a dilated pancreatic duct or dilated <coughs> biliary ductal system in these lesions um, and your big differential here is going to be the lymphoma because again the lymphomas tend to push or sort of uh, circumferentially uh, encase an artery as opposed to invade an artery or, or, or vein. <clears throat> this is what they look like on endoscopic ultrasound. Uh, so uh, again, you can see the resolution and how clearly you can appreciate the sort of anechoic areas here of cystic degeneration. You can see that, that they're fairly uh, homogenous with regards to echogenicity otherwise, and they've got very well demarcated capsule, making it sort of quite a typical appearance um, for a neuroendocrine tumor. <clears throat> 
And then this is your <coughs> just a octreotate PET CT. And again, you can see this fairly intense gallium uptake here in the, in the body of the pancreas, helping with the diagnosis. So that's your functional solid lesions. So now we're going to move on to the non-functional solid lesions. And here again, history and, and clinical examination is important as with all, all clinical uh, pathologies. Um, but the, the, the things that one should really focus on is, is uh, looking for risk factors for pancreatic uh, ductal adenocarcinomas because we know that there are risk factors associated with it. If they've got a history of pre-malignant lesions, so are they being followed up with IPMN or with mucinocystic neoplasms? And then don't forget sudden onset of uh, non-insulin dependent diabetes in the older age group as a possible sign. The clinical examination, you know, the commonest <coughs> thing that they're going to present with is pain, jaundice, and loss of weight. Um, so it's fairly sort of, although very common, uh, fairly non-specific. They do, uh, some of them have rashes or that, 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 that can assist. So when you see, you know, look for a patient with, with genetic syndromes like Pete Jager's syndrome with these sort of macular uh, lesions. Uh, on this image here, you can see uh, Trousia syndrome or superficial migratory thrombophobitis. It's often associated with, with pancreatic cancer, but, but again, not really helping you too much. So <clears throat> we, we rely on cross-sectional imaging uh, quite heavily on our solid lesions as well. And as I mentioned before, whether you decide on MRI or CT is, is really comes down to, to what you familiar with reading um, and your, your uh, you know, the costs and availability of these two imaging modalities. Um, but it's the timing and the contrast dynamics that, that one needs to, to make sure that, that one understands and appreciate that small lesions and, and isoattenuating lesions do prompt uh, a multimodal approach. So currently, because of cost and availability, MRI scan is used as a problem solving tool in, in cases where the, the lesion is not visible on CT or you've got a contraindication to, 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 to a CT, which, which we often have in patients with, with uh, nephropathies. And then more and more, as, as with EUS and all the other sort of clinical parameters, EUS is evolving in, in, in this field as well. So we know that, that it's superior to, to MRI and CT when it comes to small lesions, but the big benefit really is, is its ability to obtain tissue. And because of this, not subjecting patients to unnecessary uh, surgery in the case of these sort of tumor mimickers, uh, that often, uh, you know, we accepted in the old days a, a resection or negative resection rate of around 10 to 15 percent, and that really is is not appropriate in modern day imaging. <clears throat> we often get asked about PET CTs, and I think that the take home message is that the role is still unclear, unfortunately, when it comes to pancreatic lesions. The, the place that I see it uh, having some role is is in a patient where you where you, you, you're fairly confident that this patient has an underlying ductal adenocarcinoma or one of these malignant tumors of the pancreas that has associated high-risk features. So maybe a very large lesion or a very high CA99 or uh, a lesion with uh, sort of inconclusive lymph nodes. It's in this patient, if you don't have any other signs of metastases, that, that a PET-CT might be of value because if you do pick up distant sites, in this patient, you're going to be saving him futile surgery. And then lastly, just transabdominal ultrasound. I think we all know it's limitations. So that's when you, you sort of come down to diagnosing and operative planning of, of pancreatic lesions is not really uh, applicable. And then hopefully we, we all appreciate that ERCP because of its uh, adverse events and side effects are, are, is sort of predominantly a, a therapeutic tool and, and or, almost exclusively a therapeutic tool nine and no longer diagnostic. <clears throat> we have biomarkers for the solid lesions. And there are a couple of them from CA99, which I think we're all familiar with, right through to uh, the S100 calcium binding protein, which is less commonly used. Um, despite all of the others, it's really the CA99 that, that's most well validated 
The problem with it, and we need to appreciate the problems, is that it's got a very low positive predictive value. So it can't be used as a screening uh, marker. And there are uh, individuals uh, that are Lewis antigen negative that won't ever express or secrete CA99. Um, so giving you a, a sort of a, a falsely low level. And then those that you can have a false positive uh, are specifically those seen in biliary infection of any type or biliary obstruction. <clears throat> there is some good data coming out now on circulating free DNA and amplification of, of DNA to determine the underlying uh, uh, tumor. And, and this is, is not available currently in South Africa. I'm, I'm not aware of it any place in Africa at the moment where it's available, but, but there is some data to, to show promising results with regards to circulating free DNA, which is a blood test, so it's nice and easy. And then we've touched on pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors and chromogranin A. So I hope everyone's still awake um, because now we're coming to the pathology component and, and uh, something that sort of surgeons are not very familiar with. So from a pathology perspective, invasive ductal adenocarcinomas is a group and, and the, by far the commonest is pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma. It's, like I say, it counts for almost 90% of, of pancreatic tumors. So, so really is by far the most uh, common one. Macroscopically, it's a very sort of gritty, hard, gray-white lesion that's very poorly circumscribed and it invades local structures, which is very unlike the neuroendocrine tumors or, or uh, lymphomas. The ductal component is a bit of a mis misnomer again here because that's really based on its histological appearance and does not necessarily mean that it arises from the main duct or the side ducts. In fact, most of these lesions arrive from very small peripheral ducts. So, so it's not quite uh, like our intraductal papillary lesions that we're going to discuss later. They have a, <clears throat> they, fairly tubular glands and they, they really have this, the, the hallmark is this dense stromal fibrosis that you can see. Um, and because of that, they were given the, the, the sort of the name cirrus type carcinoma or desmoplastic carcinomas. They have variable amounts of, of nucleotipia. Um, and, and, you know, one of the sort of uh, standout features of ductal adenocarcinomas is the, the sort of abnormal location of glands. It can either be around lymphatics or nerves or, or fat or tissue planes, but, but it's really the sort of abnormal location. And here you can see perineural invasion. So here's the, the nerve and, and around the, the sort of adenocarcinoma, perineural invasion of this with this dense stromal uh, fibrotic desmoplastic, desmoplastic uh, stroma around it. There are, we do have uh, evidence of ductal differentiation <clears throat> from our immunohistochemistry stains. And, and there are a couple of glycoproteins and oncoproteins that one can stain for, as well as cytokeratin. So predominantly they stain CK7 positive and the vast majority CK20 negative, but, but there are some that are, that are CK10 positive. So it's not sort of to say that, that that's in all cases. And more recently, the molecular analysis is helping us with the, with the diagnosis and the prognosis. So ductal adenocarcinomas generally have mutations in KRAS, P16, TP53, and you have this loss of uh, SMAD4 and DPC4 in, in more than half of the cases, which is, again, unlike other tumors that we're going to touch on now. The role of EUS for pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma <coughs> is like I say, you know, evolving and, and I'm, you know, it's being brought into guidelines more and more. Um, but it can be highlighted in, in, in this case. So this was a patient who presented to us with uh, significant loss of weight and vague abdominal pain and new onset diabetes. Both MRI and CT scan were negative. There was no duct dilatation of, of any sorts. And we proceeded to do an endoscopic ultrasound, which shows a very clear hypoechoic lesion in the body of the pancreas uh, of around a centimeter in size. Um, and we were able to get tissue from the sample, which confirmed ductal adenocarcinoma. 
but there are other indications and, and like I say, it's evolving. So, so one of them is if you have a very high suspicion for an underlying malignancy, but no visible lesion on your cross-sectional imaging. If you've got surrogates of a lesion, so let's say you've got isolated pancreatic duct dilatation or obstructive jaundice, but no obvious mass, it's a very good indication for, for US. As in this case, sort of uh, symptoms suggestive of a malignancy, but a negative scan. Uh, and then lastly, uh, more and more, we're doing EUS for tissue acquisition. And, and as you all are aware, neoadjuvant chemotherapy is becoming more and more popular, but we also use it for those who, who, who want palliative chemotherapy. And then if you have a confounding differential, so the commonplace here is really those patients maybe with ARP2 or uh, chronic pancreatitis with a, with a sort of a obvious mass and you're trying to exclude uh, a malignancy through tissue acquisition and then as mentioned previously for grading of neuroendocrine tumors <clears throat> there are other invasive ductal adeno, uh, ductal carcinomas apart from adenocarcinoma they make up around four percent of pancreatic tumors to me that it's worth just knowing because although they don't have a current impact on our treatment or management, they definitely do have a prognostic outcome and a prognostic difference. And it's nice to, to counsel your patients on this. So we know that colloid carcinomas and medullary carcinomas have a very protracted, uh, good prognosis as opposed to either the adenocarcinomas or your undifferentiated and your squamous. But apart from that, uh, you know, for me, they don't add much more. Um, but it's nice to let your patients know because they all ask you sort of what, how long do I have to live in it? And it's nice to sort of give them an idea based on, on the underlying tumor. <clears throat> Next group that you need to know from a pathology perspective is the concept of pancreatic intraepithelial neoplasia. So this really refers to a small lesion. So less than a centimeter, but, but, but more often than not less than five millimeters. It is intraductal. And it's a non-invasive lesion that predates the development of an, or can predate the development of an invasive ductal carcinoma. We used to use terms like hyperplasia or atypia, uh, but we've moved away from that now. Um, most, uh, but not all pancreatic intraepithelial neoplasms are considered to progress along a, a sort of a, a timeline, a bit like the adenoma carcinoma sequence from low grade to high grade dysplasia and then eventually to a ductal adenocarcinoma. Um, and, and most of our ductal adenocarcinomas are thought to arise from pancreatic intraepithelial neoplasms. We originally used to classify these into three grades, but now grade one and two have been sort of lumped into what we call low grade and we have high-grade neoplasias. The actual significance of this, I think we're still learning about, because we know that low-grade uh, pancreatic intrathelial uh, neoplasms are quite common in the population, especially those over 50, and, and a vast majority of those are not going to go on to developing uh, pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma. Uh, but having said that, there is also a very high degree of patients who have high grade uh, PIN that do have an associated invasive component. So one needs to make sure that you act on, on high grade PIN and be aware of it. And low grade, one needs to know its limitations and be able to, to, to sieve out those that, that one's going to, to not act on because like I say, not all of them are gonna progress. I'm not going to go through this slide. It was just to highlight from a pathology perspective this sort of uh, sequence that you see not only in your PINs, but also your IPMNs and your mucinocystic neoplasms, where because of genetic mutations or deletions uh, in specific oncogenes, it progresses from low-grade to high-grade PIN and then ev eventually to your uh, pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma. And, and this group tried to elicit a, a, a time frame and they suggested that from PDAC, I mean from, from PIN low grade to PDAC was around 11 years. Uh, but there's not much data uh, to support this outside of this paper. All right, so we're now going to quickly talk about some rare pancreatic lesions, solid lesions. And um, 
although they are very rare, so this accounts really for about 5 to, to, to 8% of pancreatic cancers, there are often subtle clues in these rare lesions that gives away the diagnosis. So I'm going to start off with maybe uh, Mahir. Uh, I hope I'm pronouncing it right. Can you hear me? <clears throat> okay, let's go to Yelda. Yelda, are you there? Yes, I am. Fantastic. So Yelda, let's see if you can, uh, and don't worry if you can't, because it's, like I said, very rare lesion, but uh, this is a 71-year-old male who presents with a three-month history of swelling and pain in his peripheral joints, and he's got these painful sort of cutaneous and subcutaneous lumps throughout the body and had a fever at the time of you seeing him. The imaging here is not great, okay, so, so, so uh, I apologize for that, but this is a CT scan. And what I want to show you here is just a very well sort of demarcated lesion in the tail of the pancreas. Uh, if anything, you can appreciate the sort of area of hypodensity or uh, hypoattenuation suggestive of either cystic degeneration or, or some type of necrosis. This is a picture of the patient's knee. And you can see through, a patient had throughout his body these sort of small <clears throat> nodules that were very painful and sort of white, yellow uh, in color. And they went on to do an uh, x-ray of the patient's hand. And I'm not sure if this projects well, but they're these sort of what was thought to be these lytic lesions. Uh, why is it not going? These lytic lesions in the, in the distal phalanges where you see the arrows. So Yelda, can you, can you think of a, based just on that, a, a rare tumor of the pancreas that, that you, we might be dealing with? Um, I'm, not, I'm not really sure. Okay, no problem. I'm gonna, you're going to have a couple of goes, so, so don't worry. This, uh, these are rare tumors, so don't worry about it. But this is very typical of acinous cell carcinomas uh, and that, that imaging. So it's a rare tumor. Um, it's, it's characterized by the production of enzymes within the pancreas. The clinical vignette and the imaging that I showed you there is what we, is, is lipase hypersecretion syndrome. So the, the, the tumor secretes lipase in this patient's, in this instance, and causes sort of saponification of fat throughout the patient's body, uh, resulting in those uh, pancreatic paniculitis, which are those little lesions that, that, that are referred to there. They have a very poor, poor prognosis. So around 50% of them have metastases at the time of diagnosis. And unlike our ductal adenocarcinoma, these are stroma poor tumors, and they have an absence of those tumor mutations, uh, KRAS, TP53, TP and, and P16. And this is characteristic uh, that you might have uh, got it if you had seen these, these images, Zelda, because I think this is a bit more uh, uh, characteristic for the tumors. So they're large tumors, very well demarcated, and you can see they hyper attenuating lesions uh, and, you know, have this quite prominent area of, of necrosis and cystic degeneration within them. Uh, Zelda, your next one. <clears throat> so a three-year-old boy with a three-month history of abdominal swelling, recurrent hypoglycemic attacks and on examination, he sort of the standout thing is this macroglossia, so very large tongue that you see. You, you do a, a CT scan and, and this is the, the imaging that you see. I don't know if you want to sort of take us through what you see here and then have a go at what tumor you, you think this could be. Uh, Yelda, I'm not sure if you, I think you still mute, oh, muted. Sorry, there. sorry, yeah. I was no. muted. Yeah. yeah? So um, we can see in the um, non-contrasted image, it's like uh, the, the image on the, on the right, there is some um, evidence of calcification within the tumor. And um, it's a micro calcification. Um, it's like a clusters of them. And in the contrasted one, it's a hyper heterogeneous hypervascular lesion. Um, it's maybe some areas of a necrosis. I'm not sure if that's a necrosis or an abscess formation. It's um, not, I will say it's not invading, but it's encasing the major vessels. 
and it's pushing these structures um, rather than invading them, I think. Yeah, I mean, that, that's fantastic. I, I, I can't really add anything other than what you've just said. Uh, so that, that that's really well described. Uh, can you think of a tumor that might might do this in a in a very young kitty? Pancreaticoblastoma. Ah, oh, fantastic! There we go. Pancreaticoblastoma. Mm -hmm. You're quite right. So so this that's the sort of the, the the typical features of of this tumor. It's a rare tumor in the in kitties, but it is the commonest pancreatic tumor uh, under ten. They. Uh, Pathologically, from a histology perspective, uh, arise from acinal cell tumors, but, but more recently, they, they do want a second cell lineage. So, so either from ductal and acinal or ductal and, and um, uh, mesenchymal or one of the others or, or islet cells. They're normally very large like that, like what you've seen. So the, the mean is around sort of 13 centimeters at time of presentation. And they are associated with syndromes. And the syndrome that I gave you in, in this vignette was Beckwith vitamin syndrome, but we also see them in kitties with FAP. Um, and uh, again, unfortunately, have a very poor prognostic outcome if, if malignant. All right, so we're going to move on to the last one now, which is cystic lesions, so diagnosis and pathology. And uh, I'm sure you guys are very familiar with these. Uh, hopefully, I can teach you maybe one or two new things. Um, from a history, you know, it's really not very helpful apart from a history of pancreatitis. And because really it's only pseudocysts or IPMN that <clears throat> present with a history of pancreatitis. Outside that, they, it's just a vague abdominal pain or, or they're picked up incidentally. There, there are one or two case reports of mucinous cystic neoplasms presenting with the background history of pancreatitis, but it really is, is uh, not the norm. Clinically, the clinical examination is not very helpful, and serology, again, doesn't really add too much value with regards to the diagnosis. On imaging, whether you use a CT scan or an MRCP, again, like solid lesions, is not that important. Uh, MRCP, MRI does have a slightly higher sensitivity, but the specificity is exactly the same between the two. And there are pros and cons for each. So if you <coughs> have a lesion where you have lots of calcifications or a background history of chronic pancreatitis, or you have a, a lesion where you're already suspected to be malignant and you're wanting to assess vascular, uh, do sort of the vascular association and, and assessment around your vascular structures, then CT is probably better. But the rest outside of that MRI, uh, MRCP is probably the way to go. There are certain instances where you're going to use a multimodality uh, of both MRI and CT, and that's really in post-operative uh, recurrence patients. EUS, again, uh, is gaining more and more favor, and, and uh, both the West and Europe, as well as ourselves, are using EUS far more frequently in our algorithms. Um, currently, in the, the, the algorithms, it's really in areas where you have on your initial imaging uh, features that are concerning for an underlying malignancy, or in, in terms of following up your patients, the, the lesion is where EUS is currently advocated. But more and more, we're using it in areas of diagnostic uncertainty and to, to get cyst fluid analysis in order to make a definitive diagnosis, because we know that these lesions come with a lot of uh, high in, sort of intensive follow-ups long term and, and really knowing what the lesion is up front does make a big difference in your your your, your patient's management. ERCPs, pancreatoscopy and uh, near confocal laser endomicroscopy can be used in selected cases, but but again ERCP is really uh, for therapeutic reasons and not for, for diagnostic reasons. And in the case of pancreatoscopy, uh, for me, there are really only two indications at the moment, and that's to differentiate between chronic pancreatitis and main duct IPMN in those cases that you can't, and very rarely to, to determine the location and the extent of the IPMN uh, for your surgical resection margin where, where you're reluctant to do a total pancreatectomy. But outside that, I'm not sure that they add too much value. Your cyst fluid analysis is, is really the modern way of, of looking at these lesions. Um, 
and and just by using the amylase your ca and your glucose you really are able to uh, diagnose the vast majority of these lesions with a very high uh, sensitivity and accuracy up to 90 percent the amylase really helps in terms of a pancreatic pseudocyst because we know that, i mean it accounts for more than 75 percent of your of your cystic lesions in the pancreas and if you have a low amylase uh, it almost uh, completely excludes this as, as one of the diagnosis, really leaving you open to the others. And between the CA and the glucose, uh, you, you can differentiate the, the, the other common lesions. <clears throat> you can use DNA mutations in, in GNAS and KRAS to differentiate between mucinous and non-mucinous. And, and some data suggests that GNAS uh, mutations uh, is more common in the, in the malignant ones, but, but really yeah, i'm not sure that you know we can rely on that completely at the moment <clears throat> cytology if positive can help <clears throat> differentiate between malignant and non-malignant but it's got such a low sensitivity that that it's often not helpful and more recently because of the the now more uh, forceps or biopsy forceps we're able to obtain histology from the cell wall which which can be beneficial uh, just for time purposes, I'm not going to go into this too much, but this is a table that I'm sure that you're very familiar with. Uh, and, and really, when it comes to diagnosing pancreatic cystic lesions, this is pretty much all that one needs to know. I haven't included the pseudocyst here, um, but they really are, you know, looking at gender itself, more common in females apart from your IPMN and your neuroendocrine tumors. Age helps a lot in the sense that your uh, young teens it's more, you know, very likely going to be a pseudopapillary neoplasm. Uh, we all know the sort of the teaching of M mucinous being for mothers, so the age group of the mothers and, and serocystic neoplasms being the grandmothers, so the older population. Um, and then the location can help to a certain extent uh, in the sense that it's really IPM ends and, and serocystic neoplasms that are more commonly found in the head. The rest of the lesions are, are found more commonly in the body or tail. And then uh, the, 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 the chemistry that I refer to now, the CA, glucose, and amylase. And this really is where, where what helps you differentiate between the two because looking at these three, a combination of whether they're raised or not, uh, there's not much overlap between, between, the, between the three. So serocystic neoplasms, a hallmark here is really a very low CA and a very high glucose. Um, your amylase is, is low. Your mucinous cystic neoplasms are very similar to your IPMNs in that they've got both a high CA and a low glucose, but your amylase is, is fairly high in your IPMNs as opposed to your mucinous cystic neoplasm, which can help you between those two. And then again on EUS, it's very easy to see whether or not there's duct communication with the cyst. And, and really, if there is duct communication, it, it narrows it down to an IPMN. Uh, very, very rarely can you have communication with an MCN. But again, uh, that's exceedingly rare. <clears throat> so uh, looking at the pathology again, the pancreatic, the, the duct, intraductal neoplasms, they are tumors that arise from the ducts themselves. They, they're considered pre-invasive neoplasms, so precursors to, to invasive carcinomas. Unlike your, your PIN, which is less than one centimeter and clinically undetectable, these are clinically detectable masses of around one centimeter or larger. And there's a spectrum of morphological variants. And the one that we're all familiar with is IPMN, but there are these two others, the introductory tuber papillary neoplasms and the oncocytic papillary neoplasms, uh, but, but again, rare lesions. They seem to, they, they follow the similar uh, adenoma carcinoma sequence that we see in the, co the colon. And they more and more, we're starting to appreciate the different subsets histological subsets, and, and there the are four common ones, intestinal, pancreatic, obliterate, oncocytic, and gastric foveola. Um, uh, they morphologically look very different. So if you look at this, the top slide here, this is the commonest type, the intestinal type. Um, it has a fairly good prognosis. It expresses intestinal differentiation markers like MAC2 and CDX2, but it has these papillae that uh, almost resemble villus adenoma in the colon. Um, they've got these very elongated nuclei with this 
uh, apical mucinous cytoplasm that you can see here, as opposed to the, papilli, uh, the pancreatic papillary type here, which is, I mean, very complex papillae. It's a mixture of cuboidal and, and uh, cells and, and oval cells. The nuclei are generally quite round. Sorry, this is very small. And very typically, the nuclei lose their polarity. So, so they, they sort of, on both the apical and the basal cell of, side of the cell. The real benefit to knowing what type this is, is, is uh, I think in the future is going to be that we're going to tailor our, 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 our surveillance strategy depending on the underlying subtype histological variant. Because uh, we know that the oncocytic and the, the gastric fibula type have a very indolent clinical course as opposed to your pancreatic biliary type uh, that, that, that's you know, far more aggressive. And, and hopefully in the future, by knowing our histological variant, we're going to be able to tailor it. Um, radiologically, sorry, we're running out of time here, so I'm just going to move on quite quickly. Radiologically, again, one can uh, sort of appreciate the, the, the macroscopically different morphological subtypes. So here is an MRCP, and you can see a, a sort of what we call a side branch IPMN or branch duct IPMN. Over here is the main duct IPMN, so just the main duct being involved. And then over here, a mixed duct IPMN, where you've got both the main duct and the side branches involved. I was going to touch on ITPNN, but just because it's fairly easy to diagnose. Um, but because of time, I'm going to move on. Uh, I think radiologically, uh, the, the, the benefit of knowing it is that it, again, got a fairly uh, uh, indolent course and a better prognosis than the IPMN counterparts. And what gives it away is that they're very big uh, sort of tumors um, and they've got what we call a two-tone duct or a cork in a bottle. So if you take a wine bottle and you think about a cork being in the bottle, that's the appearance that you're getting here. And it's really because it's got this, it, it lacks that low attenuating mucin that you see in the IPMN. And because of that, you're sort of getting this two-tone duct that you can see over here. So uh, Again, quite easy to, to diagnose if you have seen it before. Mucinous cystic neoplasms. Um, these are uh, almost, I mean, far more common, almost a 10 to 1 ratio uh, with regards to female predominance. The hallmark is this ovarian subepithelial stroma that, that stains positive for both estrogen and progesterone. They don't communicate with the main pancreatic duct, unlike your IPMNs, and they have this very well-defined thick wall with these thin multilocular septations, uh, and, and unlike the IPMN, more common in the body and the tail. So on imaging, characteristically, what you can see is a sort of a, a fairly solitary cyst. You can see a very fine septation, nice thick wall. When you start seeing what we call eggshell calcification or rim-like uh, calcification, so calcification along the rim of the, the lesion, that's worrying for malignant transformation as, as is the size and, and evidence of mural nodules. So MRCP is quite helpful in this instance. And over here, you can see on the first one, a T2 weighted uh, MRC, uh, MRI. Uh, and you can see a fairly, this, you know, quite nice thick septa here. I mean, a wall here with very thin septa appreciated on this image. On the Porta Venus T1 phase, you can see these the mural nodules that seem to be enhancing. And again, over here, you can see this enhancing septa, very thin compared to, to the rim, which is nice and thick. Serous cyst adenomas. <clears throat> uh, I'm sure you know sort of the clinical background to these, but just from a pathology perspective, they're, they're four morphological subtypes and it makes it quite difficult to, to diagnose these because of them. By far the most common is the microcystic and the macrocystic, but you do get a mixed type and a solid type. So on imaging, the, the sort of the hallmark feature here is what we call stellar calcifications or this enhancing uh, uh, radiating scepter that you can see on this lesion in this lesion here. Um, and uh, they more commonly found in the head, but can be found anywhere. And they normally well, uh, quite well circumscribed. This one's not being appreciated as, as much as, or as typically as we normally see it, but they're normally fairly well circumscribed. The different patterns make it quite different, difficult to diagnose. So 
this is just showing you a macrocystic pattern and you can appreciate that the big differential is going to be a mucinous cystic neoplasm here but again if you get uh, cyst fluid analysis the, the the glucose is going to be very high with the low CA and low amylase whereby your your um, mucinous cystic neoplasm is going to ha have a high CA and a low glucose again no duct communication the microcystic pattern is referred to as honeycombing and probably the best one to sort of appreciate that is on the T2 weighted image here. You can see this sort of hyper intense lesion in, in the body of the and tail of the pancreas here. And again, on the subtraction T1 phase here, you can see the central enhancement giving a, a bit of a honeycomb pattern to this lesion. This is the microcystic. And then the one, although it's fairly rare that, that can provide problems is the pseudo solid pattern. And really the big differential here is the neuroendocrine tumor uh, where you can see a fairly sort of hyper attenuating lesion on CT scan. But if you do do an MRI uh, sequencing, you can differentiate them by having these sort of microcystic patterns, although it can be difficult at times. All right, the other last one. It's, uh, a nine-year-old girl with no past medical history of note presents with an enlarging abdominal mass and vague abdominal pain. And you do a CT scan and this is the lesion. So I don't know if you want to quickly describe the lesion and then uh, let us know what your differential would be for her. Um, so from this cut, this is a CT abdomen cross-sectional with the contrast. I can see a well demarcated mass there is a clear line between it and what it appears to be a part of um, maybe a pancreas in front of the um, renal and uh, splenic and SMV. So I cannot 100% say that this lesion is actually coming out from the pancreas, but I know that's our topic for today. Um, okay. if, if I told you that it was arising from the pancreas, what what... What would be the top of your differential in a nine-year-old girl with this type of lesion? Uh, like, this yeah, was slightly EUS. like it. Yeah. This is this was her EOS imaging. I don't know if that helps you a little bit. I mean, a slightly older in age, I would think of spin, but in a nine years old, I'm not sure what. Okay, so so you're quite right. So this is a sort of pseudopapillary neoplasm. I mean, mm -hmm. you can get them in as young, you know, as young as sort of seven, eight year olds. Uh, I've had a few patients in, in sort of uh, below ten that 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 have this. Uh, but you're quite right. More commonly, it's in your teens. Uh, again, it's an exocrine tumor. It's rare. The the the, the worrying and the reason we need to know about it is it's fifteen percent chance of being having a malignant component to it. And on imaging, I think. Uh, Yelda mentioned most of it. I'm going to show you a US picture because again, it, the, the, the definition is a lot easier to appreciate. They're normally located in the tail. They have these areas of necrosis. So you can see this hypo uh, or hypoechoic area over here, which might represent a bit of necrosis. They have these, these anechoic areas over here, which show you cyst degeneration or cystic component. They can have bleeding. So these hypoechoic sort of areas here of blood within the cyst they're very well demarcated and on ct or mri often you have uh, the the rim or the wall being uh, enhanced uh, which isn't appreciated here because it's not a contrasted eus um, but those the, the, that's sort of the typical features and and that, that one sees on a spin uh, for diagnostic reasons all right i'm sorry again for it being so didactic but uh, thank you very much for, for, for your attention and Yelda for, for participating uh, in, the, in the, the questions. I know they were very difficult uh, and they, they are rare tumors, so you're not going to get those in your uh, exams. I can, I can assure you that. Um, I'm not sure if there are any questions. Any, let's just, just want to quickly look in the chat. Okay, so uh, Shame Karan, I've actually lost that email from you. I seem to have closed it for some reason. Um, but I just, uh, Karan just uh, put in the, the chat group here just to remind everyone or 
Goku will put in here the chat group just to remind everyone to please give your feedback. There's a link there. Um, thank you very much to, to uh, the Echo Foundation and the Project Echo uh, for, for allowing me to speak tonight. And thank you everyone for being here. Um, and to Echo India for, for all the support that you give us. Uh, thank you very much. I'm not sure. There we go. So the next Echo session is going to be on the 11th of April, in, uh, which is next week. Dr. Claire Warden, which I'm sure all of you are familiar with, a fantastic speaker, is going to cover perianal fistulous disease. Um, so for all of you who can make it, I'm sure that it's going to be a very valuable session. All right. Thank you very much, everyone. There's no more questions, and I think we can close the session. Thanks, Colin. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Karen. Sorry, I lost your email, so I couldn't. Uh... That's okay. I, I think I we covered. Been... I think we covered the important things. Thanks very much. All right. Thanks, I'll Cara. Close off now. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Thank <laughs> you.